Hey, welcome back to another Bible Talk at Four Community, where we create community spaces so you can connect with others and you can also connect with God. And I, I love doing this. This is a highlight of my week. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for liking these videos. Thanks for subscribing. Please continue to do that. Awesome. So um, we're looking today at Mark chapter 1, verses 40 to 45, followership and missional crowds and uh, and all the good stuff. Let me ask you a question, though. Who matters to you and why do they matter? All of us are very unique in terms of the people that we like to reach out to, that we like to be friends with, that we like to hang out with. I know right now while I'm on lockdown, I am really, really missing the people, the guys that I like to hang out with and uh, just go for walks for the community, play darts with, eat burgers with. Oh, I miss burgers so much. I miss I miss my peeps, you know? And you've got different peeps as well. Who matters most to you and why do they matter to you? And it's, it's part of the talk today. In what way can you connect with them so that the friendships stay protected rather than having unwanted baggage in the relationship? Ah, what am I talking about? Everybody comes with unwanted baggage, but sometimes you and I get into friendships with people and they bring unwanted baggage into the friendship and they begin to assume certain things of you and they have expectations for you and the friendship that you thought you had gets a little awkward and you're not sure what happened to it. I've been a CEO at a small corporation and uh, it's funny, all of the friendships that I had because I had that position but when I walked away from that position, suddenly all the friendships walked away as well. I've been a pastor at a, at a very large church, and I had a number of friends always calling me and wanting to connect with me and, uh, and in, in organizations as well. And when I stepped down to a smaller organization to take a lead position, uh, suddenly I didn't have those friends anymore because I wasn't sitting on all those resources. I was no longer the gatekeeper of resources, and I had no more no more friends anymore. Um, Jesus knows all about the awkwardness that we can that we can have in our friendships. He knows about the expectations and the baggage that we sometimes find in our friendships that we would prefer not to be there, but they just get in there anyways. Jesus knows all about that. Uh, for Jesus, crowd culture was very important. Friends culture was very important. We're, we're talking about crowd culture today with Jesus because he was on mission because he was he was acting as a kingdom agent uh, crowd culture mattered a great deal to him the baggage that people brought into relationships which shaped the culture and the expectations of all the other people gathered around Jesus very very important uh, to Jesus he thought about the things that would shape a crowd's culture so that it would stay healthy with the ability for people connect uh, to connect with both him each other with God. He thought about that kind of stuff. He also tried to avoid things that would change the culture so that baggage and unfair expectations uh, wouldn't change the heart and activity of the people who were gathered around them. Because when crowd culture changes and weird expectations come into relationships, then that, uh, that tends to make connecting on a real, on a personal, on an honest level a little bit harder. We get into this all the time in our marriages. Sometimes a, a man and a woman have different expectations they bring into the marriage, and of course they do. And uh, sometimes it's very hard to navigate the relationship, at least in the first five to seven years, five years at least, because uh, those expectations aren't being met, and maybe those expectations don't even belong in the relationship. You know, our friends have expectations for each other. We let ourselves down all the time. We let our friends down all the time. What do we do? How do we protect crowd culture? How do we protect our friendship culture? That's what we're going to be talking about today, uh, how Jesus protected crowd culture. Heads up, kids, keep your eyes in the background because there are a number of characters hidden in the background. I've made them just a little bit bigger this week because I heard that they were so small in prior weeks that they were too fuzzy and you couldn't figure out what they were. So they're bigger this week. They should be easier for you to see. When we meet again as a group, when you're in your groups, make sure you tell everybody how many characters you saw and who you think those characters were.
Today's Bible passage comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 40 to 45. Congratulations, we have just gone through, or will have just gone through, the entire first chapter of Mark. Give yourselves a hand. Congratulate yourselves. Awesome. Mark chapter 1, verse 40 to 45, reading from the NLT, New Living Translation. A man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. Instantly, the leprosy disappeared. The man was healed. Then Jesus sent him on his way with a stern warning. Don't tell anyone about this. and Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. But the man went and spread the word, proclaiming to everyone what had happened. As a result, large crowds soon surrounded Jesus, and he couldn't publicly enter a town anywhere. He had to stay out in the secluded places, but people from everywhere kept coming to him. Here's my point for today. Crowd culture really matters. Your friendship culture really matters matters. FYI, if you get something completely different out of this text, well, that's totally awesome, and I hope you do. When we meet in our community spaces on Zoom, uh, we'll look at this text and discuss it in the groups that your ideas come out to. I'm not the only voice and opinion I want. I want people to hear, and that matters. I really want you to have a voice, too. So if you have something different that you got in the text, that's absolutely fine. There's three things I want to share with you today, three questions I have about the text for you, about your friends, about the friend circle that you have, about the people that you're trying to connect with. Here's the first question I have about this text. Do people like you or do they like what you do for them? Have you ever had people uh, come into some kind of friendship relationship with you and you discover that it wasn't you they wanted at all? It was the resources that you had. It was the benefits that came from being a friend with you. They didn't really want you. They wanted the benefits that you come with. Jesus gets you. Jesus gets that. That's exactly what we see Jesus experiencing at the end of this text today. A kingdom presence can be misinterpreted as kingdom presence presence. You got to look how that's spelt there, right? Just because God's kingdom is active here and now doesn't mean that God is like Santa Claus wanting to give out a lot of gifts to everyone who, who just wants to be blessed. Notice in the text that Jesus tells the healed guy not to tell anyone of the healing, that he did the healing, uh, because of the nature of the crowd that it would draw. I'm pretty sure that Jesus knew that the minute he started telling everybody that Jesus healed him, Jesus knew the kind of crowd that he would get. It was the kind of crowd that wanted to go to Jesus because they wanted stuff from him. They wanted his stuff. They didn't want him. They wanted his blessings and miracles. They didn't want him. They wanted a show, but they didn't want to hear what he had to say. Because the guy spreads the word about the miracle that Jesus did for him, the crowd now comes to Jesus attracted to the show. They're coming to see a magician's act. They're no longer coming to see a guy with a message to share. A miracle-seeking crowd is less responsive to the message of the gospel because they're looking for a show. They're not looking to hear the gospel. So just a heads up to you in the friendships that you're making for yourself right now. Do the people that you surround yourself with want you for your resource and your benefits, or do they want you because of you? Because you're unique, because you're special, you got your own DNA, you do life in your own unique way, and you're an awesome person. Do they like you for you, or do they like you for the benefits that you give to them? If you're trying to protect your crowd culture, if you're trying to protect your friend culture, you don't want to be offering a show and you don't want to be offering benefits. You're just offering the person, the honest to goodness person that you are in friendship with other people. Here's a second question that I feel comes straight to the text. How much do the people around you really matter to you? I think the answer should be obviously, well, they matter a lot to me, and that's good. The crowd really matters to Jesus. And it may sound confusing that suddenly, you know, Jesus tells this guy who's healed, you know, don't tell anybody uh, because I don't want, basically underneath the lines he's saying, because I don't want to attract the wrong kind of crowd. It's not that Jesus doesn't like people. He really likes people. But what's happening here is Jesus likes people who, who are interested in connecting him on a personal level. He, and it's so much harder to work with a crowd who's coming at you just for the sake of receiving benefits and, and having a miracle. Jesus wants the gospel to be heard 
everywhere to a large, the largest amount of people that he could possibly pull off. A growing crowd can help accomplish mission. A large crowd, however, that is off mission can absolutely hurt the mission. The crowd's DNA, uh, in this case, by the end of the text here, we see the, the crowd's DNA was off mission. So off mission that Jesus could no longer go into, into towns and, and homes like his practice was to actually talk to people engaged with the gospel. I know that the people around you really, really matter to you. I assume that because the people around me really, really matter to me as well. However, the tools that I use to attract people into friendship and the things that I do with people will shape the culture of my friendship group of the crowd around me. If I'm just there to perform some kind of relational miracle, to give resources, to give money, to buy food for people and they just treat me because I'm just Mr. Moneybags. It's not the kinds of friendship that I want. Do I like people? Yeah, I really like people, but I find it very difficult to manage people, to navigate people who come at me with, with these expectations that I simply can't meet. Just remember, protecting crowd culture isn't about not liking those people. Protecting crowd culture is about protecting the mission. Uh, that we're agents that want to share the gospel and communicate the gospel. Also, we're just human beings. We're people who want to connect with other, with other people on a real and honest level rather than being mistreated by those people, thinking that they can take our benefits from us without actually having a real true relationship with us. Here's the third question I have, just springing right out of the text. How can you have your cake and eat it too? Well, actually, now that I'm kind of on Weight Watchers, I can't have my cake and eat it too, unless I want to over max my points, but that's certainly not what I'm talking about. I mean, how can you have a group of friends for friends' sake and also bring Jesus into that group of friends without it feel, feeling like bait and switch, without it feeling like some kind of sales pitch? How can you have a group of friends and then when you bring Jesus into the conversation, it doesn't feel awkward. It doesn't feel like Jesus doesn't belong there. Make the mission matter the most, like Jesus did. To Jesus, the mission mattered the most. Yeah, people around him absolutely mattered. All of his disciples absolutely mattered. The crowds absolutely mattered. The mission, however, mattered the most. I mean, the deal is when, when we have trouble uh, with our friendship circles, bringing Jesus into the middle of that friendship circle and talking about Jesus, the problem really is that the mission doesn't matter the most. That sharing the gospel and uh, helping our friends come into relationship with God, that doesn't matter the most to us. It's, it's on par with having real friendships. So how can we make this work? How can we have real friendships and also be sharing the gospel at the same time? The only way to do that is to make the gospel matter the most. I can have friendships with, with all of my neighbors and all the people around me without thinking that my marriage doesn't belong in those friendships. I can, I can talk about my wife and my kids and all of those friendships without it feeling awkward. Why is that? It's not just because it's a common experience. It's because I'm not hiding my, the fact that I'm married, that, that my marriage is a priority over other friendships that I have. And because the marriage, my marriage, is a priority over all other relationships that I have with people, it's quite natural for me to bring that, that, that value that I have into the real relationship that I have. So how do we navigate friendships and bring Jesus into those friendships without it making, without it feeling awkward? Make the mission matter most. Make Jesus like the very air that you breathe. Make agency one of the higher priorities in your life so that it's not a matter of competing. It's not a matter of, oh, by the way, let me sneak something into this group. It's like this is a core value. Jesus is a core value that's part of my life. He is the guiding principle that leads everything that I do. And so it's going to be natural that I'm going to be talking about him. When attempting to draw a crowd for a crowd's sake, yeah, I, I need to make sure that gospel communication is the center of the crowd's expectation. Absolutely have to do that. If the mission doesn't matter to the crowd, it's okay to let some of them go. So the mission can be met with the crowd that remains. Here's a takeaway. Create a mission-based crowd. 
while you're making friends, while you're assessing the people around you, make sure that Jesus is part of that. If if you've got a group of friends who are just there to receive your benefits of some kind, and they're not really there to receive you as a person and honor you as a person, they're not the highest quality friends anyways. Those people around you really do matter to you. Protecting your friendship circle from, from wrong expectations about you, you know, that's not dishonoring people and not liking people. It's actually protecting you and protecting your friends group so it can be very, very healthy. Create a group of friends that know, you know, make sure all your friends know that your very first friend is Jesus. So it doesn't feel awkward for you to bring Jesus in the conversation, but it's, it's, it's quite natural, just as natural as it would be discussing your spouse or your kids. That's it for now. If you don't already have a community that you're connecting with, can I please encourage you to join for community where we create community spaces where you can connect with others and also with God. And we've got a couple of different times where we meet. We have a couple of different community spaces. You're welcome to shape a community space that works best for you. And we'd be very happy to work with you to create that community space uh, with you. Okay, see you next week.